in the previous video, we took a look at very high level in terms of, you know, creating a service, looking at pod IP addresses, all of that good stuff. Now let's actually dive a little bit deeper here into this whole pod to pod networking. So how does it all <laughs> become possible? How is this whole thing able to actually work? Well, it happens with the cube proxy and the cube proxy. These are definitions, just, you know, the straight up definition is a network proxy that runs on each node in your cluster, implementing part of the Kubernetes service concept. So your cube proxy maintains network rules on your nodes. It contains the network rules that allow network communication to your pods from the network sessions inside or outside of your cluster. And it allows network communication to your pods from sessions inside or outside of your cluster. So really the gist of it is in your data center, you have maybe, you know, Cisco, whatever equipment, routers, firewalls, switches, all that good stuff. That's the cube proxy. The cube proxy in this framework, right? Or in a networking framework, which we'll see in a second, but the cube proxy itself is all of those things combined. It's, it's all of your network equipment in one. It allows inbound communication to happen, outbound communication, all that stuff. Without the cube proxy, there'd be no networking in Kubernetes. So DNS, yeah, DNS is huge in Kubernetes. It allows you to point ingress stuff. It allows you to have services that have specific names. It allows for communication and the DNS service that runs in Kubernetes, which behind the scenes is just core DNS, has a static IP address that's hard coded into each pod for service discovery. And we're gonna talk about services in just a second, but just keep in mind that core DNS is running on the back end and that DNS service IP address is hard coded into every pod by default. You don't have to do anything about it. So pod to pod communication, how does this actually work? Well, by IP address or service and the recommended way is a service. Again, we're gonna talk about services in a second, but you have an IP address tied to each pod. Each pod has an IP address. And then inside of your pod, you have multiple containers. Well, maybe one container, maybe two, depending on your workload. And those containers share the same IP address from the pod. So that pod has one IP address, but here's the thing. That IP address is dynamic. It's ephemeral. So is the pod itself. So that's really where services come into play. Now services, the name never changes unless you delete the service it's never going to change. And it exposes a specific set of pods. So the service is actually pointing to the Kubernetes deployment spec. And then that spec is, you know, deploying two pods, three pods, etc. So even though those pods are ephemeral, the service is not. And it's always pointing to the pod. So that service name is always the same. And that's exactly why it's recommended to use services instead of pod IP addresses, because those can always change. Right. So service connections. Now, when you create a service and again, we did it a little bit in the previous video, but we're going to do more of it in this video because the previous video was really more to just get you thinking high level, all that good stuff. This is kind of going a little bit more in depth. So when you have a Kubernetes service, like again, like we did in the previous video, you have a few different options for connections. So the first is a load balancer, and that essentially is just the standard way to connect to a service externally to the internet. So for example, let's say I have an Nginx deployment running inside of my application. Well, inside of Kubernetes rather. I can have a load balancer IP address that I can use to hit that Nginx application. The cluster IP, and that's the default Kubernetes service for internal communication. So keep in mind that's internal to the cluster. But external traffic can access the default Kubernetes cluster IP services through a proxy. And then you have the node port and that opens ports on the nodes or virtual machines and traffic is forwarded from the ports to the service. It's pretty good for like, you know, demo apps and stuff like that, but you know, you wouldn't really want to use that from a production standpoint. And then you have ingress. Now ingress is a huge one. We're going to be talking about it very much throughout this series here, but essentially what it does is you have an IP address and that IP address is pointing to multiple different services. So you can essentially use the same load balancer to hit multiple applications. Kind of reminds me of like an Nginx reverse proxy. So in QProxy, the first or second slide, I forget, <laughs> we mentioned that 
there are these network frameworks. And that's really what the container network interface is. And there are a bunch of different ones. You could check out Weave, Flannel, Calico. There's a bunch of different frameworks. Now, if you're using Kubernetes in the cloud, like AKS, EKS, you don't have to worry about it too much because that stuff's kind of built in. But if you're spinning up a raw Kubernetes cluster, you will have to worry about it. So what are our primary goals from a networking standpoint? Well, number one, pod to pod communication. We need pods to be able to talk to each other. Like for example, let's say you have three microservices, backend, middleware, front end. Those are all going to be running separate pods. So they need to be able to communicate with each other. Next, pod to service communication. So those Kubernetes services we've been talking about. And then external to service communication. So services, ingress, pretty much anything if you want to get out to the internet or come in to the cluster. Now let's go ahead and head over to our VS code and we're going to take a look at some stuff running in Azure Kubernetes Service or AKS. All right, so this is the same application that we had previously that we tested in the previous video when we were running on Minikube. And we're going to check out the same thing inside of Azure. So I'm going to run kubectl create minus f nginx.yaml. Now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to run kubectl get service. And as you can see here, we do have the nginx service. It has that cluster IP, but there's no external IP. So let's go ahead and actually set that up. And then what I'm going to do right under ports is I'm going to type in type equals load balancer. Oh, there we go. All right, so now let's run kubectl create minus f nginx.yaml again. And then we'll run kubectl get service. Now, as you can see, we now have an external IP that's in the pending state. So while we're waiting for that, let's run kubectl get pods. I'm going to snatch up this pod address here. I'm going to run kubectl describe pods. And if we scroll up here, we can see the networking that's happening on this pod. So for example, here's the pods IP address. Now I want you to keep this in mind, the 10.2440.10. Try this one more time, kubectl get pods output wide, All right? Go ahead and keep that IP address in mind, okay? So now I'm gonna run kubectl get service again. And now we have this IP address right here. So this is our load balancer IP address. So we have that load balancer IP address and we have the service name. So now what I want to do is I'm going to run kubectl delete pods and I'm going to delete the pod with the IP address of 10244010. Right, kubectl get pods again. Now because of our deployment, it just self healed. So it recreated the pod, except check this out. I'll put wide. The IP address is no longer 10. It's actually 12 now. So it's 10 12. So from an ephemeral standpoint, this is never going to work. The other thing too is take a look at the name. Notice here how this one ends in Z44 and the previous one ended in G2H8C. So the name of the pod itself and the IP address is ephemeral. So that's why you need a service. So even though I deleted the pod and the IP address changed, the name of the pod changed, the IP address of the service never changed, and the service name never changed. So from a Kubernetes pod to pod communication standpoint, you definitely want to ensure that you create services.